Good evening. Buenas noches. My name is Janet Pichardo. I'm the Interim Director of Family Engagement for the Providence School Department. Hola, mi nombre es Janet Pichardo. Estoy la directora, soy la directora interina de involucramiento para padres. Thank you so much for joining this Zoom session um, for the facilities planning engagement. Gracias por asistir esta reunión sobre la participación de la planificación de nuestros edificios escolares. Antes de empezar, vamos a lo que vamos a hacer es que lo vamos a dar algunas instrucciones sobre las normas y cómo vamos a interactuar durante este Zoom. Antes, so as we move forward, I'm going to go into go into some um, slide presentations just to provide you some information in terms of some norms and logistics with regard to this webinar. It also will have some instructions for um, some of our parents who are joining us who need Spanish interpretation and providing them some guidance for this. Okay, so the information is here right on your screen. La información está aquí en su pantalla. Voy a decir la información en inglés y entonces en español. So you can see here um, as part of the norms, uh, this is the way we will um, interact with each other. So again, just reminding everyone, the presentation is a webinar format. You will not be able to see each other, only the panelists, the interpreters, and the facilitators. The panelists will try to answer as many questions as possible, uh, but we want to make sure that you use the Q&A icon, and we'll go through some um, instructions in a minute. Prior to asking your question in writing, please state the name of the school you represent. Also, we are working with an interpreter, actually two interpreters, for this session. Thank you in advance for your patience and possible slight delays in some of the content delivery. We want to make sure that all attendees are receiving the information. And also, you will notice that the microphones are also um, are all muted. You will see also that we've provided you with a website, so that way um, you can seek more information uh, and, and future updates. Para las personas que hablan español y necesitan esta información en español, miren hacia abajo y lo ven en, en rojo. Y esta información de nuevo es solamente para dar una idea cómo vamos a interactuar durante esta, esta sesión de Zoom. La presentación será un formato de seminario web. No podrán verse solo a los panelistas y el intérprete y el facilitador. Los panelistas tratarán de responder el mayor número posible de preguntas. Por favor, utilice el icono de preguntas y respuestas que usted mira al fondo de la pantalla. Antes de hacer su pregunta por escrito, indique el nombre de la escuela que representa. Estamos trabajando con un intérprete, pero tenemos dos esta noche para esta sesión. Gracias de antemano por su paciencia con posibles retrasos leves en algunos de los contenidos de entrega. Queremos asegurarnos de que todos los asistentes reciban la información. También déjale saber que el micrófono está silenciado. Este, silenciarán los micrófonos para todos. Y abajo pueden ver este, un sitio web que pueden buscar más información y también actualizaciones futuras. Entonces, aquí este, van a mirar que van a poder acceder si miran hacia abajo de su, este, su pantalla. Para las personas que necesitan traducción, tenemos dos intérpretes. De nuevo, si presionan interpretación, el globo que miran hacia abajo, cuando ya lo abran, esto van a mirar el idioma español y ahí pueden entonces elegir ese idioma y de una vez van a entrar a un canal que van a poder escuchar los intérpretes. Again, um, these are just some instructions for our audience, um, our parents who are needing access to interpretation and just again, providing them some instructions. Um, so you can see at the, so I just read um, the, the first one um, is just providing some guidance on how to access the interpreters. Uh, the second bullet here is just letting you know again that if you are joining uh, the meeting from a phone or a tablet, um, how you are able to interact with us in terms of that function. Um, and also at the very bottom, you know, please make sure that you use the Q&A and write in your question. 
Entonces, de nuevo, por favor, miren este, las letras en español. Estas son las instrucciones para poder acceder cómo van a entrar sus preguntas y respuestas. Ok. And then um, here again is just letting you know um, how to access the, the Q&A, but also reminding you that the chat feature is also available. And we will try our best as possible to answer any questions you might have. Vamos a tratar lo más posible de contestar todas las preguntas que estén ustedes esta noche. Cualquier inquietud este, sobre la, este, la interpretación, por favor, lo pueden poner en Q&A y ahí yo lo voy a poder este, contestar. Okay, gracias. Thank you. Now I will pass it on to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, my name is Zach Scott, and I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Operations. And I'll uh, be walking us through a presentation tonight. Uh, and how we structured uh, these sessions before is we'll do uh, some presentation, uh, but we'll also have time for polls and question and answer. So we ensure uh, we're sharing information, but also hearing what is top of mind uh, for individuals on the call. So I'm joined by Manuel Cordero, who will help us um, with some of the facilitation uh, as we go throughout. So we'll have different times to pause and take uh, kind of do poll questions based on some of the content that we shared. So with that, uh, I'll just get right into the content and I'll ask that I think I may need Janet to, uh, or who's, whomever is sharing the screen, if you uh, unshare, I can go ahead and share my uh, screen. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so let me just make sure I have it set up correctly. Great. Excellent. Um, so as we shared, uh, our goal is to share information on facilities. We've had a session earlier this week uh, on the same topic uh, and, and also in the months uh, in November and December, we had uh, some additional engagement around uh, uh, the recently passed bond. Actually, what I thought we could do is start, uh, is start with a um, just a quick video. And so hopefully we got the technology to work so people can see it. So I will turn it on now, uh, but it's a, I think helpful way to display in a relatively quickly, a lot of the work that's underway. The Providence Public School District is in the midst of a turnaround. There's great momentum, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Our school district has over $900 million in building deficiencies throughout its 40 schools. We spend $6 million a year in utility bills alone, and another $20 million a year on cleaning and maintaining our buildings, many of which are over 100 years old. In 2017, the state conducted an assessment of all public school buildings and gave each facility a score between 0% and 100%. Any building graded with a score over 65% was considered a replacement candidate. Providence was found to have over 10 with Facility Conditions Index scores, FCI scores, over 65%, including several over 100%. The Providence Public School District has seen a decrease of 3,200 students over the last five years, a decline equivalent to the size of Johnston Public Schools, a district with just seven buildings. Over the next five years, PPSD is projected to see a decrease of another 3,200 students, the equivalent of Lincoln, a district with six buildings. Because COVID, declining population, and other factors have shrunk our student body, our district simply doesn't have the need for such an aging building infrastructure. It's time to reimagine our schools by prioritizing PK to 8 schools that keep kids together in the community and build new expectations brick by brick. To give our students facilities designed to enhance their learning experience, not detract from it. Modern, energy efficient buildings will generate millions in operational savings each year and help support with additional full-time teachers, guidance counselors, and other services that will directly benefit our students. It's time to bring 21st century learning built on equity, accessibility, and excellence to the diverse communities we serve. For the students we teach and nurture, the teachers who engage and inspire, and the families who trust us with their children every school year. 
Providence Public Schools, turning hope into results. So now let me get back to the presentation. And, and I know uh, that went somewhat quickly. Um, and uh, but uh, just please know we, we will cover much of what was mentioned there in, in greater detail. So uh, let me just make sure I can get to the next slide here. Um, so to open us up and just uh, uh, kind of think big picture, when we look as, as the um, video mentioned, when we look at our facilities, and this is unfortunately true for, for folks who have been in our schools, uh, they do have a significant need. Uh, and what we see is over $900 million in needed repairs and upgrades just to make our schools warm, safe, and dry. Uh, not even to the level that we'd want, uh, just to kind of to, to get our schools to have basic repairs done. Now, while that's a challenge, we are in the fortunate situation, thanks to the city of Providence uh, and the uh, citizens of Providence, that we have uh, over $500 million to invest in our schools. So while it doesn't meet that full need uh, that we mentioned, it puts a lot of, uh, allows us to do a lot more work than has been done ever in the city of Providence. So we are thankful and grateful for that opportunity. So with that, it allows us to set an expectation that's much higher than we've had before. And that's for moving from schools where we have roughly 5% currently of our schools that are considered new or like new to more than 50% in the next five to six years. So obviously that's an, both an ambitious goal, but one that also feels not like it's fully meeting our vision of 100%, uh, but we are optimistic that is the, uh, the first step in a much needed process to revitalize the schools in Providence. To share a little bit about what engagement has been done to date, um, because this has not been, um, you know, this is a, this has been an ongoing process. So, for those uh, who you may who may know, uh, five years ago in November of 2018, there was an original bond passed to support greater investment in school facilities. A similar bond was in, uh, passed in 2020, and over that time, there has been ongoing engagement with construction actually already underway, and we'll be excited to share. Uh, what some of that upcoming construction completion uh, looks like, uh, but that has been uh, that that has been ongoing since 2018. We've had a, another round of bond funding come through in November of 2022. This past fall, that included 125 million in city funding and an additional 110 million in state funding. Since that time, we've doubled down on engagement to support uh, feedback on uh, from the community on how. Uh, both the long-term uh, vision of uh, what the long-term vision of facilities look like in Providence. Uh, and then over the upcoming months uh, through sessions like this, we'll continue to gather feedback as we develop that longer term plan for construction. Just to highlight a few of the things that we've been able to see so far, and then we'll turn over to a quick poll. So as you mentioned through this forum, as well as uh, forums directly related to facilities or indirectly related to facilities, as well as working with schools that are undergoing construction, we've learned from the community and, and students and family and faculty what is most important in our schools. Um, we have seen some uh, significant improvements completed since 2019 and some that are just on the horizon that we'll talk through shortly. I'll talk a little bit more uh, in a second about swing space, but that's been critical both to our current uh, uh, progress as well as future progress uh, to ensure greater construction and, and facilities work in Providence. And then lastly, we've, you, while we focused on that bond funding that I mentioned about, uh, we also have invested a lot of money directly from the school department's budget into a revolving fund, which has allowed us to use money uh, more wisely and uh, uh, stretch the impact of our dollars to do not just those major capital projects that we'll talk about, but also projects like boiler repairs, uh, uh, water, water filler uh, installations and things like that. So with that, I'll actually uh, I'll invite Manuel Cordero to join us, who will help with some of the facilitation this evening. And what we'll do is uh, you'll, we'll use the poll function in Zoom, uh, and I'll ask this question, and then I'll walk through a few more slides as we're processing uh, the results before coming back and sharing what those results were. So with that, I'll turn it over to Manuel Cordero to introduce himself and share a little bit more about, um, uh, walk us through this question. Good evening, buenas noches. Uh, my name is Manuel Cordero. I'm going to be helping this evening with the facilitation. 
this is going to look a couple of different ways. Uh, you'll get uh, this time we'll do a poll. A little bit later, we'll do a Q and A, uh, and then we'll go back uh, to a poll. Uh, so the first poll question will appear on your screens in just a moment. Uh, the poll question is, what resonated with you in the video that you just saw uh, and uh, the vision that you just heard? Uh, and or what would you want uh, community leaders uh, and the district administrators to keep in mind as they open new school buildings? Uh, so again, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we're asking you to do a poll. I'm going to give you about uh, two minutes, uh, and uh, we just want to get a quick little bit of feedback uh, on this question about what resonated with you from the, the video you just saw in the vision, and regardless of what you heard so far, what do you want to share with district and city leaders as we embark on this plan that SAC just shared about? Uh, so we'll give you uh, a few moments. Uh, again, the poll uh, has a field where you can enter a long or short answer. Uh, we'll do our best to provide some uh, live feedback in uh, in after a few slides, uh, just so that you get an idea of what uh, some of your other community members uh, who have joined us this evening are thinking as well. So we have just about another 40 seconds. And again, uh, long answers or short, we welcome them all. Uh, this is the a kind of big picture question right now, and uh, later on we'll have other opportunities for a little bit more kind of uh, dialed in uh, or closer look questions. So a few more seconds. What resonated with you in this video and vision? What should the district and city leaders keep in mind as we open new school buildings? All right, so we are uh, almost at time. I'm going to give you another few seconds, finish uh, wrapping up your thoughts if you haven't already, uh, enter them into the blank field, uh, and we will collect those answers. Uh, all right, I think we can close the poll. Again, thank you uh, if you participated in this poll. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Zach. He's going to share a little bit more information, and then we'll take a pause, and uh, I'll share some of the feedback uh, that we collected. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, so while we're looking through the poll results, I wanted to share some of the work that is already underway uh, and will be completed soon that we are uh, very excited about. So the first slide here is a, uh, a visual of the Narducci Learning Center, formerly known as the Windmill Elementary School. Uh, and I'll share why it's important to our facilities work. Uh, not only will it be uh, a new, like new school in our district, but it also allows the district uh, to use swing space as we're doing construction. So to spend a moment or two on that, uh, what swing space allows uh, districts to do, and it's something that Providence has not had, and it's kind of limited the ability to do major construction, but it allows a school to temporarily relocate to another space while significant construction is done. Uh, and then that school can move back in once that construction has completed. And what that does is uh, several things. First, and perhaps most importantly, it makes sure that construction does not disrupt student learning. And so it's not that, it, that there's not construction that's happening during the day, or where students need to you know, move around within the building in ways that might not be ideal. It also allows you to do the work more quickly because as, as you can imagine, when you have to do construction just at night or just on the weekends or over the summer, you miss out on valuable time to do that during the day. And because you can do it quicker, it also allows you to do it more cost effectively. So what Windmill allows us to do is, uh, is allow us to, to actually do some of that significant construction more quickly in schools, have them locate to, uh, while they're at uh, a, a site like Windmill before 
moving back to their school. And so windmill will be completed this spring and ready for school in the fall. Another highlight to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, that is coming up is the Hope High School Auditorium. So what you'll see here is a rendering of uh, the Hope High School uh, Auditorium. And for those who, who have been in the space, it's, it's a beautiful space with a lot of potential, but it's been you know, under cared for over the past several decades. And we anticipate in the spring it looking like this uh, and, and, uh, and having kind of a world-class uh, art space for our students. Another uh, uh, building that we're incredibly excited about, and you know, as we've talked about much of this construction work, it had often been years and years out, but like Narducci, the Narducci Learning Center, the Spaziano Elementary uh, School is anticipated for completion at the start of the 2023 school year. And, and what you see here is a rendering, uh, but it is well into construction uh, and will be ready for the start of the, the school year next year. I'll also highlight Classical High School. So like Hope, Classical is another one of our high schools on the older side that is having a uh, significant renovations done. And uh, what you'll see here are is a common space that you, you can see both uh, new layouts in terms of space usage, but also the new furniture that will help uh, in those learning spaces. And then lastly, the third school that will be opening uh, at the start of next school year is a new William DeBate uh, Elementary School. So that is a school that has been uh, actually in temporary swing space now at, at Carl G. Loro, but uh, which has allowed significant construction to happen at DeBate Elementary School. That school will then move back uh, into its former home uh, at the start of next school year uh, and will you know, take advantage of the space you see here, which is a, a much different uh, you know, learning environment. Uh, and, and rather than kind of just new paint on the walls, a very significant overhaul of what actually the learning spaces look like in that school. So with that, and if, if the uh, poll worked its magic, we hopefully should have this information. So Manuel's given me the thumbs up and can share a little bit of what he's heard. Thank you, Zach. Uh, yeah, what a great response. Uh, super exciting to see uh, such an engaged uh, audience. So uh, I'm gonna just uh, share with you some of the highlights. Uh, we got a lot, a lot of responses, so I'll kind of uh, uh, aggregate some of them. Uh, but we uh, are hearing in terms of what resonated uh, from the vision and video and what should city leaders and district leaders keep in mind when opening new buildings. Security uh, came up actually several times. Uh, somebody asked or brought up the question of, of pre-K-8 and the age difference being concerning. Uh, appreciate the new technology in, in advanced buildings. Uh, there's uh, several of these that express excitement on the upgrading of buildings that need attention um, and uh, and keeping in mind the community members want to keep uh, up to date. Uh, the buildings look welcoming. Um, somebody uh, says that they appreciate that uh, for their children. Uh, anticipating uh, folks are anticipating a lot of changes and, and that's certainly uh, true. Uh, there is a desire for uh, transparency on the progress of projects and uh, 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 timelines. Uh, so understanding what the timelines are of projects, uh, that's certainly something that, uh, that can be made available. Uh, there's questions about uh, whether it's just new schools building uh, from the ground up or renovation, and, and somebody else actually says that they hope that there's uh, both. Uh, and, and I guess we should clarify, and, and you probably saw from the images that Zach just shared, that, that it is a, a mix of renovation and new construction. Um, somebody did uh, mention that they're uh, concerned about transportation, and in fact, they were trying to attend the transportation Zoom. Uh, maybe uh, one of uh, our partners uh, on the Zoom can provide instructions in the chat. Um, somebody asked or connects to the question of attendance rate, which is uh, such a good observation. And certainly uh, there is a correlation with, uh, with the condition of schools. Um, excitement about energy, energy efficiency buildings, sorry, energy, energy efficient buildings. I need to slow down. 
uh, and safe place for play. Uh, so that uh, I know was a, a quick uh, run through, but uh, a lot of great feedback here. Thank you. Uh, and we'll hand it back to Zach and we'll be back in a few moments with a question and answer. Thanks, Manuel. And before we move into the content, super helpful to hear what's on people's minds so we can make sure we're addressing it as we go through. To, to address a few of the things I heard, and, and Manuel can help me when I'm, if I miss any major themes. One, just technical question around the transportation Zoom. Um, we do apologize that Zoom was scheduled at the same time and needed to be rescheduled due to uh, a team member's um, emergency uh, uh, family issue. So we apologize. If you would, if, if you were uh, the individual or individuals who were looking to attend that, please uh, include your email address in the Q&A and we'll take that down to make sure, uh, you know, we'll reschedule that Zoom, but we wanna make sure we do an individual reach out to you if you had specific questions. Uh, I, I do wanna highlight the, the question around construction, new construction versus renovation. Uh, and as Manuel noted, uh, that is so far that's been a it's been a little bit of, of a mix of both in that we have schools like uh, classical and uh, and hope uh, are, are schools that are having renovations uh, without much you know significant change of the actual building um, whereas some of the other ones that are underway are new builds um, I will say that uh, we will will continue to we'll, we'll continue to do both I think one of the lessons we've learned is, we do want to ensure there is a um, a good amount of new construction in part because what we've seen historically is as you do small projects kind of spread out amongst a number of schools uh, what happens is you can, often can do you might fix the floors in one school uh, only to have to come back in three years because the roof's leaking and so when you have 100 year old buildings there are times that it is just frankly more cost effective to do a a total kind of rebuild of that school. So that is some of the, the, the calculus that goes into it, but we do anticipate having a mix of both construction and remodeling uh, as we go ahead. So just to share a little bit of, of, of factors that come into play when we think about uh, how we make decisions around building in our long-term facilities plan. And we'll, we'll try to go through these in order because I think as, as, as I hope we'll, we'll uh, be able to share with you tonight, a lot of this has to do with using and, and uh, triangulating a number of factors to help make uh, longer term plans versus any one factor driving that decision. So what, what I'll start with uh, is some information on enrollment uh, because that while it's not obviously a facilities issue, it is something that has close, close connections to facilities. So I apologize because there's a lot of information here, but it's a, it's a complex, complex topic. So I'll try to distill it uh, as best I can. So at the highest level, when we think of enrollment, uh, it's important to note that um, districts across the country, region and state have seen uh, significant enrollment declines, particularly over the past several years. Uh, so some of that has to do with both demographic changes in terms of the number of, of students entering school, um, but it also has to do with just a decline in enrollment that was seen across the country and across the region uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so you'll see some specific notes here from nearby states like New York and Massachusetts who have seen uh, some of those declines. So that's really like, when you look at the national level, um, uh, that's important to note. Then if we zoom into Rhode Island, and what you'll see here is a little bit of a longer time horizon, uh, roughly 20 years back. And you'll note that um, we've seen as a state some significant declines in enrollment since that time. And that, uh, you know, I think what that uh, has caused the state to do over the past several decades is as they're providing funding to schools, there are actually incentives for schools to be smart about, you know, if you have fewer students incentivizing districts to invest, invest, invest more intensely in a, in a smaller number of schools, knowing that as, as we've seen, uh, you know, nearly 20,000 uh, student decline, that the number of schools match the number of students that we have. So that's the at the state level and again declines over the past you know several decades particularly in the last and then what we'll look here at is providence both looking back as well as what we project looking forward uh, and this was highlighted in the video that we've seen over three uh, uh, over a three thousand student decline over the last six years a decline equivalent to johnson public schools 
and that we anticipate another 3,200 students uh, decline in the next few years. Many things we could talk to and share about that. Two important facts that I want to highlight here. First, that enrollment decline obviously impacts um, uh, uh, different grade levels differently. So as you'll note, nearly two thirds of that decline is at the elementary level, smaller declines, but still significant middle school level, and then somewhat uh, uh, lower declines at the high school level. And as you can imagine, as those grades roll, roll up to the next grade each year, we expect to see that uh, decline at those upper grades further up. So important fact is just knowing that enrollment declines don't impact the school, you know, the district uniformly by grade level. And as, as we'll see shortly, you know, it doesn't in, impact it uniformly by school. Uh, it also has an impact on, on funding. Uh, we, you know, we are funded by this largely by the state uh, through state aid. Uh, and every you know student ha has uh, there is uh, funding associated with each student. So that decline uh, also results in a decline of funding to the district that you know requires us to think uh, differently and, and particularly smart about our resources because we want to ensure we are maximizing the amount of resources going uh, to our students and schools. So just to connect this to the slide I shared last, and again a lot of data, so I'll do my best to highlight the most important points here, but. As I shared, enrollment declines don't impact the district uniformly, and they don't, in, 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 and certainly have different impacts at the school level. And so, what you'll see here is uh, an overlay of our elementary schools across the city, along with utilization information by uh, by zone. So, when I say utilization, if a school could ha could house 100 students and they uh, only house 90, then that school would be at 90% utilization. And so the numbers you see here are the amount of open seats. So if a school has, you know, a 7%, you see the North having a 7% number, that means it's around 93% full or, you know, there's about 7% of empty seats there when you look at overall utilization. And the, a couple of important facts to take away is the impact of, uh, of underutilization is kind of very different when you look across the city. When we look at places like the Northwest and Southwest, uh, you know, locations where either there are a lot of students or a fewer number of schools that were largely at capacity. But when you look at regions like the central or south or east, there is a, a, a significant amount of excess capacity. And that has to do with a number of factors, some of which are, you know, it is, it is related to where uh, both students live, as well as the, the presence or the, the number of seats available in that part of the city. Um, and it also has to do with parent choice. Uh, as a choice district, where, where uh, at all levels people can choose and put preference for different schools, uh, it, it tells us a little bit about not only where students live, but also the schools that they prefer to go to. So that was a little bit about enrollment. And as we talk through utilization, you start to see the connections between enrollment and facilities. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now I wanna talk more specifically about facilities and talk through some of the numbers you heard in that opening uh, presentation about the amount of need in our district. So um, uh, a, most, a recent study looking at all of our schools identified $900 million in basic repairs just to make it warm, safe, and dry. So those are repairs, frankly, that uh, if you were to put into, into our buildings, uh, they again might be warmer, there might be less leaks, but they would not feel like particularly different learning spaces. Just as if you imagine if you had a 15 or 20 year old car, you put in a new, uh, you know, your transmission goes, you put in a new transmission. It's not cheap, costs a lot of money to do that, but the car is, you know, probably not going to feel a whole lot different than, than it did before that transmission. If we wanted to buy, a, 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 you know, make our buildings brand new and, and fully remodel all the schools, that would take over $2 billion. So, Again, while $500 million is a lot uh, to invest and we're incredibly uh, grateful and thankful for that, we still need to be ensure we're being wise with it because the need is so uh, significant. So then let's talk through the need at a more granular level. And I encourage folks to look at our uh, rebuildpvdschools.com website uh, because you actually have a school by school reports here that give you a little more information on our different schools. Um, when we look at our elementary schools, we know that there are a significant number at replacement level, with many lacking green spaces and other features needed for 21st century learning. To explain that a little more, um, we, you know, facility quality is rated on a, on a scale of zero to 100, 
with the higher being, uh, you know, uh, a school that requires a significant amount of repairs to bring it up to uh, where we'd like it to be. Uh, so that replacement level is typically over 65%. So we do have a number of elementary schools that are at that level. But when we think about our elementary schools and frankly, all of our schools, it is not just about building quality, but it's also about um, kind of the unique features of the, the school or parcel of land that they're on. So to be very specific, one of the things we've heard very uh, consistently as we've talked with families is the need for green space. And there are some schools that may have the same building quality where the one school has a significant amount of green space near it, perhaps it's located near a recreation center or something else that would identify it as a school that even though it is um, of low quality, it might be for remodeling or replacement because there are, again, green space, uh, a recreation center or something nearby it that would uh, uh, you know, support greater investment. So that's at, at the elementary schools, we have, uh, that's our biggest set of schools uh, and there are a number that are at replacement level. At our middle schools, uh, those are our oldest and lowest rated buildings. So five out of seven uh, are um, kind of in, in, in significant need of repair. Uh, and so it's the, they are both um, uh, on the low quality side, but also very large. So I think it would take roughly 40-ish million dollars just to make each of those warm, safe and dry, because not only is it that the school kind of has significant need, but because it's so large, it would take a lot of funding to renovate it. High schools are a different, a different story in that uh, there are more newer, higher quality facilities at that grade level. So you have schools such as PCTA, that's very new. Uh, schools like Alvarez, JSEC, and 360 that are also on the new side. And then schools like Classical and, and Hope High School that are having significant repairs underway. Uh, and Mount Pleasant is the one outlier. So Mount Pleasant, uh, all the repairs um, at our high schools taken together do not equal the total amount needed at Mount Pleasant. Uh, and because of that, we think that school is a, is a prime candidate for significant investment and support on the facility side in the coming years. And we'll share more about that when we look at some of the future plans. The last thing I'll say in this spans across is that, you know, one of the hidden costs here is not only does it take a lot to repair these buildings, but it takes a lot to heat. As you can imagine, for those of you who um, have lived in you know, older houses, the, the, the impact on, on heating and cleaning is not small. And so part of what we hope is as we uh, have these newer buildings, we'll be able to improve some of the energy efficiency, both uh, for the sake of the environment, but also for the sake of the district's budget. So with that, we'll turn to our next uh, Q&A question from Manuel, which is to, to reflect on some of the data we just shared around enrollment and building quality. Thank you, Zach. Uh, so we would like to invite you this time to use the Q&A function. Uh, that is the button at the bottom of your screen with the Q and the A. Uh, and this is just an opportunity for us to reflect on all of the great information uh, provided by Zach just now. Uh, if you have any questions, either about the enrollment or the building quality, uh, you can use that Q&A function uh, and send us your questions. And again, uh, right now we're uh, focusing on the piece uh, regarding uh, enrollments and building quality. So I'll give everybody a moment. Uh, again, please uh, do take a, a moment to offer any questions that you might have about enrollment and or building quality. And we do understand that there's some um, uh, graphic issues. Uh, there's a, a appear to be some, yeah, I think we'll stop and share again. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, 
some of the initial questions that we're seeing are about specific schools. Um, I think for the in the interest of time and for the purpose of, of this meeting, uh, we won't be addressing every specific school. But what I might do is uh, ask uh, Zach just to share for folks who are interested in, in specific schools, uh, what is the best way to find out uh, information about what might be happening at a specific school? And Sorry, Min, Min, while I was looking at the, the chats, were you, was there a question? The specific yeah, yeah, sorry. The, uh, just taking that question about specific schools and making it uh, broader for today. If folks have interest in finding out more about a specific school or their school, what's the best way to find out about what might be happening? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I will uh, share a couple ways, both, uh, both we'll talk about today as well as how we can track ongoing uh, construction. So throughout today's presentation, uh, we'll be sharing information on some of the upcoming uh, major school construction projects that are planned for the coming years. So we will uh, share that here. I would say um, with this new round of bond funding, we do anticipate a few more projects um, being uh, planned uh, for, and we'll share a little bit about the initial thinking there. Um, those projects are a little bit further out, but we do expect to have some uh, prime candidates in the upcoming uh, upcoming months. So we'll we'll share that and that information. We can uh, you can always learn more at our re rebuildpvdschools.com website, as well as uh, our school building committee. So that's a uh, that's a a public uh, organization that includes members of uh, the school department, the city, family members, uh, principals. Um, that help uh, guide the, the district's, uh, you know, recommendations on school construction. So that's another place where if you're interested and really want to get into it, can join the conversation around school construction. Um, so lastly, and I see there are uh, questions I've seen a few come in for individual schools and what we might try to answer them in the chat, but, uh, but to Manuel's point to, to answer some of those more broadly, so what you'll see is some major capital projects, but know that those are not the only repairs projects that will be done district-wide. And what we'll use is our capital revolving fund, which is around seven to $8 million per year uh, to make some of those not full school construction, but other places to make both kind of necessary needed uh, repairs for warm, safe and dry things, but also uh, for items we know uh, are important for our community. So let me give you an example of some that um, that we've had already. So uh, for some of you who have may, you may have seen this in your schools, we've done uh, significant, um, oops, I'm sorry, I think it must be my chat that is causing it. I just got a, a message that there's a blob in the middle. I apologize, is it still there? Uh, I will keep going, but. One, um, one of the blobs is gone, but there's, there's one towards the top of the. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry for the blobs here. Um, so, um, but but uh, let me just highlight a few of the um, investments people may have seen already with this revolving fund. So one of the things we heard loud and clear from our students and family members during the pandemic was both access to water and concerns about old water fountains. And so we made investments where across the city, uh, we added a significant number of bottle filling stations so those you might have, I'm used to seeing them only, you know, in, in a public setting or at an airport. Um, but now we have them in each of our, uh, most, most all of our schools uh, for students to use water bottles and, and, uh, and have better access to water. So that's an investment we're seeing district wide beyond some of the major capital projects. And while you may not have seen this one, it is, is probably just as important, if not more, we've added a, a number of boilers, brand new boilers in our school. So those help uh, our schools stay warm and functioning during, particularly during the cold months. So um, those types of projects uh, we try to share out at the school building committee, but uh, it's a good reminder we should find other avenues to share beyond those major capital projects, some of the day-to-day -day work that's happening at our school. Uh, and I see there- Okay. Are... Go ahead, Manuel. 
Oh yeah, so uh, we have had a couple more questions coming in and, and certainly keep them coming. Uh, so uh, actually we heard about security uh, previously and uh, we have a, a question about security now. Uh, are the new buildings, uh, how are the new buildings gonna be secured as part of this process? Absolutely. So security has been something that has been on our mind, uh, obviously for quite some time, but is, is certainly key to school construction. So let me start by sharing a little bit about the state of, of kind of school security infrastructure. And school security is a, includes a number of things. Uh, I My first thought often goes to, to cameras and things like that, but it's also doors and, and uh, entrances and exits and also the way the entrances to schools are set up. So to share about how we've been addressing that on an ongoing basis and how we plan to address through new school construction. So one of the things we've learned, uh, you know, that that because these security over time has been uh, kind of accomplished through, in some cases, either individual projects at a school or done across different schools over multiple years, we, we end up having a kind of a hodgepodge of, of different types of camera systems at each school. Uh, and so you know, that, that is understandable. It does take a significant amount of money to rent, uh, to rehabilitate the security systems. But it also, when you have multiple systems uh, across schools, not helpful when you're trying to look across and ensuring kind of consistent quality across schools. So we have, uh, we're about, the, about to end, we've had a, cons uh, uh, a security consultant on board to come and help us identify the, the right specifications. So the right type of equipment we should be using across our schools and give us, giving us a really comprehensive school by school recommendation on school security. Now that we have that information, our plan will be to go out uh, and procure a vendor to start work uh, next school year to, to start implementing at our schools um, to enhance their security. So we would you know, start likely with schools that either have no or limited uh, cameras uh, and then expand that to all schools as we do uh, kind of an overall replacement. Uh, the other nice thing about that kind of getting that standard specification is it has allowed us to um, uh, it has allowed us to as we're building these new schools make sure that is kind of the starting point for those schools. So rather than you know that that having that standard set of what the cameras we need or equipment or hardware like uh, doors and things like that, we actually can have that as we build each of our new schools rather than having to add that on after the schools are launched. Thank you, Zach. Uh, and I'm going to uh, throw another question your way, this one actually on the enrollment side. So uh, an attendee asks, uh, with some classes having as many as 20 or more students in them, uh, if we consolidate schools, how many kids are going to be in a classroom? Uh, and uh, in addition, what is the impact uh, with on transportation, both uh, bus and parent? So the, the kind of traffic impact of, or possible traffic impact of uh, the consolidation. Yeah, so I can answer both for um, uh, the coming year as well as how we think about this longer term. So uh, we do have two, two schools that are slated for closure next year. Broad Street and Morrow uh, Elementary. Uh, and the average class size, uh, the maximum class size is 26, but our average at our elementary schools is roughly 21 and a half. Uh, when we look at the uh, you know, projections for next year, it increases slightly by on average one student to 22 and a half. Uh, and so we, we do know that uh, obviously, uh, you know, we, we are not close to that maximum class size, nor do we necessarily want to be. Um, but but while there are no reasons and challenges with closing schools, uh, when you have a, you know, a number of students spread out across a broader set of schools, um, it, mean, it might mean that a, a school that is normally, that is only at 50% capacity, it is hard to staff a full-time art teacher, a full-time music teacher. So our hope is that while you might see a small rise in class size, they'll be at schools that are both a better kind of facilities quality and may have access to uh, more uh, supports at the school. Um, to talk about transportation, I think we'll we'll see the impact of that uh, next year slightly, but it's important to note that of the schools that are closing, 
Um, one, you know, has about uh, over 80% of students are already receiving transportation. And so it actually could go down in the sense that some students might be going to a, a nearby school. Uh, and the other school has around 40% of students that qualify for transportation. So those schools are also already there is um, uh, transportation, but we believe there are a number of schools nearby uh, uh, those students' homes that might alleviate some of that. So that's that's kind of how we're thinking in the short term about enrollment and transportation. I think longer term, you know, it's important to note anytime we do school construction, we're obligated, and it's also the right thing to do, is to do a traffic study uh, during that build. So we are building with, you know, thinking through, okay, if we're going to have buses doing drop off here, parents doing pick up here, what does that mean for traffic patterns? And we work with our colleagues in the city of Providence to identify any mitigation strategies, whether that's a crosswalk, whether that's speed cameras, whether that's uh, extra traffic lights to help mitigate any transportation issues in that sense. Um, and then on the enrollment side, I do think, you know, as we, uh, you know, like, like I mentioned, we are still well under the uh, maximum class size and we don't expect to be anywhere close to that, but, but over time, as we are able to, uh, you know, build new schools, we'll be able to ensure they are kind of spaces that are suited for 21st century learning rather than some of our older spaces uh, and that, you know, the, that, that they're adequate in terms of staffing and supports that uh, those schools need. Thank you, Zach. And uh, I think we have addressed all the open questions. So uh, if you do have a question, uh, feel free to continue to use the Q&A and we'll try our best to answer as we go along. Uh, and with that, we'll continue with another portion of the presentation. Uh, Zach. Thank you, Manuel. All right, now I want to talk a little bit more about what was highlighted earlier about pre-K-8. So to, to be more specific, because I know that can be a little jargony, is that when we think of our schools in Providence, they are typically K through five, so kindergarten through fifth grade as an elementary school. And then uh, our middle schools, with the exception of one, go uh, from grade six to grade eight. Uh, what we are... Uh, you know, pursuing in some of this long-term facilities planning is a transition from uh, those K-5 to 6-8 to more schools that are pre-K-8, meaning you would have uh, students would enroll uh, as early as pre-K or, or just in kindergarten, and then be able to stay in that same school uh, through eighth grade. Uh, and that might mean, um, in some cases, it's all one building. Uh, it could also mean that you have uh, two buildings that are close by, one housing a kind of a lower campus and one housing an upper campus. And we'll show you a few examples of, of that coming up. But, um, you know, we'll talk through some of the benefits, but let me share some of the why and how, you know, this became a priority of the district. One of the things we consistently heard from parents and families as we were doing community engagement was just some general concern about the middle school experience for students. Uh, and I think it came uh, from a number of angles, both uh, concerns about, you know, a, a feeling of a decline in engagement uh, between uh, of students and families at that grade level, uh, concerns about, you know, having built connections with peers and, and uh, adults uh, in schools, and then in some cases having to then move to a new school that might not be close by or a different part of the city, um, and having some disruption at a time in our, in, in children's lives when there is a lot going on um, in those middle school ages. And so, it, you know, it forced us to think of how can we use facilities and facilities planning to potentially address some of that. And so one of the things we've seen in other districts and we wanted to pursue was providing pre-K-8 options in, in parts of the city for families to um, to uh, to enroll in and, and, and seeing if that would be one way to address some of the challenges that we see. So what we wanted to share here are some of the benefits we've seen in, in both some of the research we've done as well as some of the conversations we've, we've had with other districts. So what we'll share here are some of the advantages. Uh, so, so a few are building a greater sense of continuity and minimizing transition. So just to what I had said before, having less kind of changing and transition points for students uh, uh, in some studies have shown kind of more consistent academic outcomes uh, at the middle school level. 
uh, to that point that builds better connection between uh, students uh, and allowing the students to be kind of better understood because they're with that, that group of faculty for a longer time. Similarly, you see uh, potentially greater family involvement. So it's uh, knowing that it's even a, a longer term commitment that uh, is being made, then there's greater investment uh, with that school. And then greater coordination in student learning so that the sixth grade teachers you know, know the fifth graders uh, that are coming up because they had been in the school the year before and some potential benefits of that. That said, we know that um, you know just making a school a K eight doesn't make it, you know, by any means better, and that there are challenges that need to be thought thought of, planned for, and addressed to ensure we're maximizing the potential impact and benefits that a K eight could have. So, what are a few of these that we see? One is uh, having cohesive school culture and behavioral standards. Um, so, uh, and, and this is what we had heard, I think, in some of the early comments about. You know, just wrapping our heads around having buildings where you have, you know, very young students and, and very old students. And so how do you build a, a you know, both a, a big sense of community across grades while recognizing that there are kind of our kindergartners are in very different stages of life than our eighth graders? And how do you kind of create cultural school, cultural and behavioral standards that work for all? And then the other one is, is about program offerings and allocation of resources. Um, so one, when you think of the standard middle school, at least in Providence, they are per grade much larger. And while there are some challenges with that, and I think we highlighted some of the challenges on the previous slide uh, in terms of what the benefits of, of a K-8 are, the, the, the benefits of having really large middle school schools is um, sometimes it may be easier to offer different types of electives and things like that. So it's not not something that is um, insurmountable with the K-8, but it's something we need to be intentionally thoughtful about as we are designing those schools, um, because there are, you know, some natural uh, benefits of having uh, larger middle schools that you might not see in a smaller uh, pre-K-8 setting. So that's some of the research to share what we've heard in, in previous calls. It'll just echo, I think, some of that because people understand intuitively, again, what some of those benefits and challenges are. So. What we see here are some quotes from families about excited about being uh, the ability to not only stay with peers and administrators, but actually be in the same school with a sibling for a longer time. That allows us to create a longer uh, term community uh, and a greater kind of connection with teachers and faculty in the building for a longer period of time. Similarly, we heard some of the concerns and challenges about uh, co-locating students, not only in schools, but potentially on buses. Uh, and how you kind of manage that, you know, how you have a full, you know, K-8 school sense of community while recognizing there are probably some smaller learning communities, whether that's by grade or across a few grades that you want to grow and nurture. So we've heard a lot of that feedback already, and we want to share, you know, as we're doing the designs, how we're taking that feedback into account and what we've seen in other places to address both to take advantages, uh, advantage of some of the benefits, but also to mitigate any potential challenges and concerns. So one, we'll just talk through kind of a facilities, you know, a, a specific facilities uh, approach to, to addressing uh, pre-K eights is just being intentional about the location of students and actually having potentially, you know, younger students being in a different part of the building than, than the older students. Um, so that might mean separate wings or floors for oldest and youngest students, separate bathrooms, uh, you might have different entrances and exits, either for the building or for community spaces. Um, and in some cases, you might have multiple gyms or multiple cafeterias or, again, different entrances for those spaces so that you are, again, not, you know, being thoughtful about how you are commingling students of different ages and grades. Uh, it's important to note, you know, there are obviously facilities decisions that need to be made, but a lot of programmatic ones, too, um, that can that can impact this. So one is thinking about arrival and dismissal. And in some cases, many, uh, many K-8s actually have different arrival and dismissal times for different student ages. So that might be one thing to be considered here. It also think, you can also think about staffing. And in some cases, schools have an assistant principal that might, might support specifically the youngest students with another one supporting their older students uh, as, as a way to support, again, smaller learning communities within a broader school. And then lastly, thinking and being thoughtful about cross-school cooperative ex extracurriculars. So one interesting thing is actually 
you know, the concerns we hear around um, students of different ages uh, being in the same building. We've seen places actually take advantage of that by having opportunities for older students to serve as mentors or reading buddies with some of the younger students in the building. So it's finding ways to be thoughtful, both about addressing the concerns, but actually taking, uh, taking advantage of some of the unique opportunities you have with students uh, in that building uh, from, from kindergarten to, to age uh, to eighth grade. So with that, I will turn it over to Manuel to walk us through our next poll question around uh, advantages and opportunities in pre-K-8 schools. Thank you, Zach. So uh, we're gonna go back to the poll format. So uh, in a moment, you should see a poll pop up on your screen and it will ask you uh, what advantages and opportunities of pre-K-8 schools resonated with you. Uh, and again, uh, we shared with you some of what we have already heard, some of the work and research that has been done, uh, but we want to certainly hear from you what advantages and opportunities for you see in the pre-K-8, what has resonated with you, or what maybe have you uh, not heard that might be an advantage and opportunity, if you're already thinking about what some of the challenges might be, wait just one short moment. Uh, we will actually have a, a question right after this one for challenges. Uh, so for this uh, moment right now, we're asking uh, to focus on advantages and opportunities for the pre-K-8. And again, uh, if you're joining us uh, now and uh, this is the first poll you're doing, uh, we are just asking you to share some of your thoughts about uh, this last portion of the presentation regarding pre-K-8s. Uh, we're doing about a two-minute window for you to provide your answers, long or short, in the field under the question in the pop-up window that appears uh, that appeared uh, on your Zoom screen. So we have about another minute left. And similar to before, we'll ask uh, first advantages and opportunities, and then we'll ask you about challenges, and then we'll share out some of what we heard regarding both advantages and opportunities, but also challenges of pre k eights. So about another 30 seconds to share advantages and opportunities of pre k eights. And tell us what resonated in the presentation you just heard, as well as any other thoughts you, you might have, advantages or opportunities of pre-K eights. So we are at about time. I'll give you another few seconds to wrap up. Again, just uh, enter your answers, long or short, into the field uh, in English or in Spanish. And uh, we will share those out with you in a moment. So let's go ahead and close this poll. And we'll go move on to the next slide and the next uh, poll. And as I mentioned, the next one now that should be appearing, uh, a poll should appear on your screens that asks you for the challenges of pre-K-8. Um, again, uh, I will give you about two minutes. Uh, please share with us what challenges of pre-K schools resonated with you. You may have heard some of the challenges already, either from the research or from our previous meetings with community members. You may have your own challenges that you didn't see reflected in there. We welcome them all. They will help inform the planning team. And again, for those of you joining us a little bit later, uh, we are conducting polls to gather uh, 
feedback and questions about the information that we're providing. We'll reflect that information back to you, but we'll also fold it into our planning process. So we have about another 20, 30 seconds left. Start wrapping up your answers for the question of what challenges of pre K schools resonated with you. All right, so we are at time. Uh, wrap up your answers for the question of what challenges of pre-K schools resonated with you. And uh, we will go ahead and close that poll. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity before we move on to uh, the last portion of the presentation, uh, just to share with you some of the answers that we just heard. So on the question of advantages of pre-K eights, we heard uh, continuity and community. Uh, the idea of children being together uh, with their friends and uh, grow in self-esteem. Uh, the advantage of siblings being together longer. Uh, excited about the continuity in a K-8 school. Uh, the advantage of uh, a student going up to eighth grade in the same school. Uh, but there is a concern, uh, and again, I'll express both the advantages, but also the concerns, but a concern with uh, 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 bathrooms and, uh, and play areas. So just the question of, of eight different age groups. Uh, opportunities of cross-curricular, uh, of improving overall facilities, uh, and having their students together, so siblings together for a longer period of time. Um, and uh, we do have folks who, who acknowledge that they're joining in a little bit late, but, uh, but like the idea of going uh, in one school and not having to move around. Uh, so those are some of the uh, advantages that we heard. On the question of challenges regarding pre-K-8, uh, the adequate separation of the ages uh, and uh, the, the challenge of, of the olders having a, 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 a less than positive influence on the smaller students. Um, uh, uh, children, the, the younger children having their own bathrooms, uh, and uh, and again the separation of, of grades. So it, it seems like most of the answers have to do with the with uh, ensuring that there's uh, good spatial separation of the grades. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back to Sec. Thank you all for your feedback on on this poll question, and we'll go on to the next section. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, so now to talk through a little bit of what comes next. And so um, what we have here, just a little bit of how, again, distilling a lot of that information when we look at building quality, enrollment, and what we've heard from our community to then translate that into this approach of trying to, in knowing that we'll need fewer schools, but wanting to invest more heavily to get to that, at least 50% of our students in like new schools, and really trying to expand that number of pre-K opportunities. So with that, we are actually well on the way uh, to having that work done based on work that has been planned uh, several years ago and is currently underway. So a few, again, that I'll highlight that we've already talked about, uh, but it's uh, important to, to reiterate. So we do have schools like Hope and Classical having construction underway now uh, and having re renovations done in those schools. When you look at William Debate, the Narducci Learning Center, 
and the Spaziano uh, Pre-K-5, uh, part of the pre ultimate Pre-K-8 campus. Those are schools that will be done at the start of next school year. And so while we've talked and haven't had kind of new construction in Providence for um, maybe over a, a, a near a decade, we will have three uh, like new schools online at the start of next school year that we are incredibly excited about. Pleasant View is a school that uh, is undergoing, uh, will undergo construction this summer into next school year. It will likely temporarily relocate to the Narducci Learning Center for next year so that construction can be done at Pleasant View before it returns back uh, to the Pleasant View campus the following year. So those are construction that, uh, the, all that construction is right around the corner. We have three sets of, uh, of, of new school builds that will uh, be a little bit further out, but are well into the design. That uh, those schools are uh, Mary Fogarty Pre-K, uh, Harry Kazarian Pre-K, and then the 6-8 campus of Spaziano. So some of you may know that Spaziano uh, has been a two campus school for some time. It had an elementary school, uh, a lower kind of lower grades in one campus and the upper grades in another. Uh, and there's some significant renovations that will be that are being done to the one of those campuses and then by another campus in the future. Then we will have a two kind of a multi campus uh, pre K through eight uh, on the kind of Spaziano uh, set of land. Uh, Mary Fogarty and, and the Harry Kazarian School will be, uh, you know, full renovations or rebuilds. Um, and what we're excited is that is that as we look across the city, we see, uh, you know, construction uh, touching a, a wide range of parts of parts of the uh, of our community. So we're excited that um, we'll have not just a, a larger number of students in like new schools, but much of that will be spread across uh, the city. Also uh, excited to talk about what comes next. So like we shared, uh, the city has received additional funding through this most re recent round of bond funding. And while that construction uh, likely uh, takes a while to begin because of the design and plan that needs to happen, we're very anxious and excited to begin that design and planning process. So what we know or we what we anticipate is, um, you know, potentially three uh, builds uh, or significant renovations as part of this recent round of bond funding. Two would be uh, pre-K-8 uh, schools uh, based on neighborhoods that are in high demand. Um, and that that we're kind of currently in the analysis and study phase to understand, you know, what, what parts of the city, what school locations might make the most sense for these pre-K-8s. And that is something that we plan to work through with the community uh, over the coming months before a more kind of formal plan on which uh, where, where construction might occur uh, would happen uh, in the fall. Uh, and the other one that we highlighted and, and mentioned earlier was Mount Pleasant High School. Uh, that is a school that has such significant needs. I think uh, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly, it's nearly $150 million just to make that school warm, safe, and dry. And so we think uh, we know that that school is um, kind of a kind of a hallmark of that community. Uh, it's an important part of having a high school on that uh, in that neighborhood and in that part of town. Uh, so um, we we are looking forward to uh, significant investment in Mount Pleasant High School. Now, again, we're in the early uh, analysis stage of this, so much needs to be determined about whether this is a remodel uh, of the school, a renovation of the school, or potentially a rebuild. Uh, but a lot of that is going to have to come down to, you know, feasibility studies of how much it would cost to do those different options. Uh, what options, if you were to to renovate or or what have you, where you might relocate the students to, uh, if that's even possible. So much to be done. But we know, given the need there and given the feedback from the community, that Mount Pleasant uh, will likely be a part of that next round, uh, the use of that next round of funding. So to put that all together. Uh, and, and walk through that kind of in, in timeline because uh, there are things that are both, uh, you know, very exciting and on the horizon. And even though the exciting other builds might be a little further out, we want to make sure we are thinking uh, um, uh, like we, we want to make sure we have a good sequence of events uh, for uh, uh, construction here. So again, we see a few that are coming online next year, then a uh, pleasant view the following year. And then much of the new six, eight construction starts happening uh, or schools start coming online in the 25, 26 school year and beyond in addition to that Mount Pleasant build. So 
that gives us ample time to you know plan both for the facilities impact but also the programmatic impact of schools as as, as they have a six uh, at a sixth seventh and eighth grade so with that uh kind of a selfish question for us which is uh you know we we really enjoy having these engagement sessions in person at, and on zoom um, but we want to hear from you about what both what information you want to see as well as what's the best way to communicate facilities planning updates with you. So with that, I'll have Manuel walk us to our uh, what I believe is our final poll question. This is our final poll question, and uh, we're uh, arriving towards the end of the meeting. So I appreciate everybody uh, who's listened in and do want to hear from you what information you want to hear in the future. So let's go ahead and launch uh, this next poll. Uh, again, uh, like the other polls, uh, important feedback for us will give you about two minutes to share. Uh, and uh, as Zach just mentioned, uh, this is one of many opportunities that the district is trying to create to gather feedback. Uh, so the question that we're asking here is what information do you want to see in future engagement sessions? And what's the best way to communicate facilities planning updates? So what is your preferred way to communicate uh, or to receive communications about uh, planning? Again, this is information that will help uh, the district uh, in the future as this work continues. I think uh, many of you already have shared that you want to stay engaged in this process. Uh, and are interested uh, either at the district level or, or in your particular schools. Uh, so please do tell us uh, what's the best way to keep you engaged and keep you informed of uh, the process as it continues. Uh, so I'll give you another 40 seconds to wrap up. Uh, again, uh, your answers can be long or short. Uh, just use the blank field in the poll uh, in front of you. So again, you have another uh, little moment to uh, finish providing feedback. Again, this is uh, our last question. We're uh, at the end or towards the end of the presentation. Just a couple more slides to share with you, uh, but would really appreciate just hearing from you what information you want to see in the future and what's the best way to communicate about it. Uh, so go ahead and uh, wrap up your answers and put them in the field. Uh, we are at time and uh, I'm going to have uh, the poll closed. So again, thank you all for your participation and uh, and providing feedback uh, throughout this process, throughout this meeting, but also about how you want to communicate in the future. So with that, I'll pass it back to Zach. Thank you. And with that, we're getting close to the end. So we'll take this information on how to best engage in the future. And that'll be helpful as we uh, plan ahead and continue this uh, ongoing conversation with our uh, family, students, and faculty members. So uh, what we do know is to, uh, that folks can stay up to date and engage by going to the rebuildpvdschools.com website. You'll be able to see uh, some different uh, information and videos there. Uh, and also you can, we'd ask that you include your email address there so we can keep you informed and aware of any upcoming events. We do plan to start scheduling more neighborhood specific meetings in February, March, and ideally we'll be able to do those in person and take advantage of some, I know there are um, you know, plenty of meetings going on uh, at any given time. So we'll try to join with any, some of our partners uh, in the city or, or other spaces to align with other meetings and events you might be going into, into your neighborhood. So. We plan to uh, uh, do those in the coming weeks and months. And then we're incredibly excited as we get close to the start of the new school year with some of our new schools to be able to show them off. And I think we've all, uh, you know, as we've been doing this planning, a lot of the times we've had to go to nearby districts uh, around the state that have had new schools to show off what is possible. And we're excited that next year, uh, people will be coming to Providence to see uh, what those brand new schools look like. So we're excited to show 
certainly our families, uh, students, and faculty members first, um, what those schools will look like. So um, that is, you know, not too not too far away. So we're excited to share that information uh, and opportunities with you. So with that, I will actually show our last video here, and then uh, we'll see Q and A. But we'll we'll probably wrap up for the night, and again, look forward to the uh, continued engagement. So. Uh, here comes our uh, uh, our last video. Sorry, second still laid here on my end. We're asking our teachers and our students to learn 21st century skills, but they're in buildings that were built 100 years ago. So the facility upgrades, as much as anything, send a message to our students. We care, we know, we believe in you, and we're gonna be investing millions in you. So it's a huge message, not just to our students, but to our families. $500 million is a lot of money. So being able to understand why it's there and how could it benefit you as a student and probably your peers, or if you have siblings, what could that do for them in their future? When I think about my little cousins who are in PBSD, like what do I want their future to be after I leave high school? The money's gonna help us create the environment that our students and our teachers need in order to be successful. We want to make sure our students are trained and ready and have all the resources that they need in order to go out to society and be productive members. They spend a lot of time here and as a parent, I want to make sure that they're comfortable, but as a parent, I want to feel comfortable myself when I'm at work, when I'm at home, knowing that my children are in a safe place, are with the tools that they need, they're not falling behind because they don't have a Chromebook, they don't have a computer. It's kind of like an emotional um, support, basically, to have all the tools that you need to see all the changes. One thing that really stood out to me is like every day when I would walk in, it would just like just be so like nice and beautiful, and I would just like, okay, like, hmm, that's like a good way to start my Day. Now when we receive updates and renovations, it's like they're like, okay, like I'm coming to an environment that I believe I can learn the way I want to learn. This brick is a symbol of how we're changing what's happening in Providence. We're tearing down low expectations and building a system that really respects educators, students' knowledge, and we're building a stronger system academically, emotionally, and physically. This is a new, better, and improved system that will launch our kids forward. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with you in the coming uh, weeks and months. So with that, we'll probably wrap up for the night, uh, unless anyone has last minute questions, but thank you so much again. Thank you all for your participation.